Good morning. Welcome to the 2024 International Conference on World War II Pre-Conference Symposium, The Battle of the Bulge Revisited 80 Years On. I'm Jeremy Collins, the Senior Director of Programs at the Museum's Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. And it's going to be my pleasure to serve as your Master of Ceremonies throughout the weekend. When we put this year's program together, the theme for the symposium was pretty easy for our conference planning committee, as we are mere weeks away from commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge. We thought that was what this audience would want and need and sort of expect from us. You guys are a red meat audience. But what we wanted to do when putting the program together was challenge ourselves and challenge you all a little bit and not go through the regular greatest hits. Nothing against them, but we've heard a lot and talked a lot about Bastogne, the 101st Airborne and its defense of Bastogne, Patton and his relief or rescue of Bastogne. So we wanted to uh, try to look at the Ardennes Offensive uh, through a different perspective, and I think we've got a great slate of speakers and panels and sessions for you today. To kick off our symposium on the Battle of the Bulge, it is fitting that we do so with our General Raymond E. Mason, Jr. Distinguished Lecture on World War II. As General Mason himself was a young armor officer serving in the 4th Armored Division under Patton in World War II, he went on to an illustrious career serving in the Pentagon and then went into a business career that allowed for him to and his wife to be more philanthropic, and they established the General Raymond E. Mason Distinguished Lecture Series back in 2007, and it has now become our longest serving lecture series here at the museum. Our speaker, the Mason Distinguished Lecture, is Anthony Tucker Jones. Anthony is the author of over 60 books, even though he had 60 books, it took about uh, 50 or so of those before we first had him here in 2021 when he spoke on Churchill, Master, and Commander in our partnered program with the Churchill Society of New Orleans. If you would please refer to your program today and throughout the weekend, you will get a more fulsome biography of all of our speakers, but so that we have time for one last question during Q&A, I'm going to make all of the intros pretty short. And I'd also ask if you could please be nice to Anthony, because he's due back in about two weeks to give a presentation on his latest book, Churchill Cold Warrior, and I don't want him to cancel that. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Tucker Jones. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, very nice to see a sea of expectant faces so early in the morning. Um, obviously, as, it's, as Jeremy's just said, it's the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge, and a, quite a good time, I think, to reassess its impact on the, um, on the Second World War. Bear with me. As Jeremy's just said, when he uh, invited me to come along to talk to you today, he said, Anthony, please bear in mind the audience are going to know all the main beats of the battle, as he's just said, uh, and all the iconic moments. And I said, well, that's fine, uh, because my book on the battle, Hitler's Winter, looks at it purely um, from the German perspective. So I'm hoping this morning I can give you maybe slightly different flavor uh, to what transpired uh, on the German side. And this morning, um, we've got some great sessions looking at intelligence, acts of heroism, the air war, so Operation Baseplate, and also the neglected Allied northern counterattack, which, as I'm sure some of you are aware, proved to be quite controversial due to the politics between the Brits and the Americans. Um, so it'll be interesting to sit in on that session. Um, but essentially, why Hitler's winter? Well, in late 1944, there were four unrelated but sort of related battles fought on the Western Front. The first, obviously, the one you all know, the Battle of the Bulge. 
but also the lesser known rocket and flying bomb offensive against the port of Antwerp. The air offensive, which I've just mentioned, uh, against Allied forward air bases. And then finally, the German counteroffensive in the Alsace to the south. Why these battles? Well, because they stemmed from a, demand, a debate sorry, in the German camp from what they called the big or small solution. They were trying to look for a way to shore up the crumbling Western Front following the summer of 1944 on D-Day. And, and conversely, at the same time, Hitler was also trying to find uh, a way of shoring up the Eastern Front. And my colleague, Prit Buttar, will be uh, discussing that later during the week. But did Operation Watch on the Rhine, as the Germans called it, or also Autumn Mist, rather odd name for uh, an aggressive operation, but of course they called it Watch on the Rhine to fool the Allies into thinking it was some sort of defensive operation. But was it ever achievable from the start? Well, this chap uh, on your right-hand side, Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, CNC West, Commander-in-Chief West, uh, on the Western Front, um, he said, if we reached the River Moose, we should have got down on our knees and thank God, let alone reach Antwerp. So not a ringing endorsement for Hitler's idea for Watch on the Rhine and a thrust to the port of Antwerp. Let me set the scene. By the winter of 1944, the port at Antwerp had become Hitler's holy grail. And there was a reason for that, because it only just opened in November 1944. So supplies to the Allied armies were only just beginning to come through that port. And there was a reason for this. Ever since D-Day, Hitler had instructed all his garrisons in the Channel ports, and indeed in the ports of Brittany, that they were to hold out to the last man. They were to treat them as fortresses. And in the event of them being overwhelmed, they were systematically to wreck the docking facilities which is indeed what they did to the port in Cherbourg. It took forever to get the, the docks up and running for the Allies. So for a long time, they were functioning with supplies coming across open beaches. And of course, the supply chain across Northwest Europe was that famous Red Ball Express, this 24-7 convoy of lorries being driven backwards and forwards to those ports in France that were open, up to the arms at the front. So hardly an ideal solution to the Allies' supply problems. Now, Antwerp had actually been liberated by the Allies at the beginning of September, but Hitler very cleverly clung on to both banks of the Shell Estuary, which leads into the port. And he had what was called the Breskin's Pocket on the southern shore, and he'd also fortified the island of Valkyren and Bevland to the north. So he'd successfully delayed the Allies, the port, until the winter, uh, forcing the Allies to conduct Operation Infatuate after they'd over overcome the Breskin's pocket. They launched this amphibious operation against uh, Valkron. But even once they overcome the German defences, they still had to clear all the mines out of the Scheldt, and that had taken until November. So Hitler got it in his mind that if he could retake the port during the winter, it would be a major blow to the Allied war effort, and also would cause some pause for thought. And what he wanted to do was strike through the wooded Ardennes area and create what he called, in his own words, a new Dunkirk. So he wanted to trap Allied forces in Belgium and the southern Netherlands and, and force them to carry out seaborne evacuation. Now, ever since Germany's defeat in Normandy in 1944, Hitler was desperate to, to launch a counterattack, a major counteroffensive, on the Western Front. But he was told by his generals that it would take until the end of the year to rejuvenate his battered armies. And so initially, Watch on the Rhine was scheduled for 25th of November, but as we'll see, and as you all know, I'm sure, it kept slipping. Now, logical route, obviously, to get to Antwerp would be via the Netherlands. The Germans were still occupying the northern Netherlands, and so they could have struck southwards towards the port. But the problem of the Netherlands, as us Brits had discovered with Operation Market Garden, the country's covered in canals, major rivers, uh, and dikes. Famously, of course, you can see here the bridge at Nijmegen. 
So the southern Netherlands, and deep northern Netherlands, is not a good area for manoeuvre warfare. Furthermore, the German garrison forces in the northern Netherlands, where they were still holding out, consisted of 25th Army and parts of 15th Army. And both those formations were largely infantry formations. They lacked tanks, they, so they weren't going anywhere. So a strike south wasn't really feasible. Further south, the German city of Aachen, that's quite near, as the crow flies, quite near to Antwerp. Um, but again, the terrain's not good. It's hilly, it's mountainous, it's covered in trees. And also in October, the American army had captured Aachen, the first German city to fall to the Allies, which meant there was a strong US army concentration in that area. So again, not an ideal route um, to attack. Therefore, Hitler had got it into his head that south of Aachen, through the Eiffel Mountains, and into the Ardennes was his preferred route. And he envisaged a three-week dash, which by anyone's reckoning is a pretty ambitious timetable. But why do it? Well, thanks to Albert Speer, Nazi Germany's uh, armaments minister, Hitler's weapons factories had pulled off an absolute miracle and they had rejuvenated the German 5th Panzer Army, which had been badly mauled in Normandy, and also helped to create a new army, 6th Panzer Army, also variously, variously known as 6th SS Panzer Army. Uh, we can discuss that later. Um, so he created two new Panzer Armies with which to strike the Allies. Now, during uh, 1944 and 40, uh, sorry, 43 and 44. Hitler had suffered major manpower losses in Tunisia, Russia, and France. Now, to make these good, Heinrich Himmler, the uh, SS Reichsführer, uh, Hitler's number two, if you like, during the autumn and winter of 1944, he created these things called Volks uh, Divisions, or Volks Grenadier Divisions, so People's Grenadier Divisions. Uh, and he did this by scraping up the last of Germany's male manpower by conscripting it, and also rounding up Flotsam and Jetsam from the Luftwaffe and the Navy rounded up all ground personnel from those services. And he created around about 20 uh, Volksgrenadier divisions, 12 of which would be available for the Ardennes Offensive. Um, crucially, they were about half the strength of a regular army division. But what they did was they tried to boost their firepower to give them more clout. So that partially solved the infantry problem. There would be infantry divisions, or Volksgrenadier divisions, to support the panzers. But Hitler was also going for a quality over quantity solution. Oh. Bear with. He was going for a quality over quantity solution. Now, I'm sure... Oh. Ah, oh, there we go. That's it. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this thing. Iconic Second World War tank. Konig's Tiger, or the Royal Tiger, or the Tiger II. Very well armoured, powerful gun, designed as a breakthrough tank. And Hitler was pinning a lot of faith on this, cutting through the Allied lines with impunity. And that would create the point of his spearhead, if you like. While in the air, he had his new wonder weapons, including Messerschmitt 262, jet fighter and fighter bomber. So he thought that would shoot the Allied air forces from the skies, and it would also plough our way along for his advancing panzers. And he also had these things, the V weapons, the V1 flying bomb, uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you in the audience will go, Anthony, there's a cockpit on that one. Uh, it's actually a prototype, uh, which thankfully was never put into production. Uh, it was unmanned. So he had these flying bombs, uh, which were coming online by the summer of 1944, really strategic weapons. But he was going to use the V1 and the V2 rocket as a tactical weapon. They were really built as terror weapons to try and beat London uh, into submission. But Hitler decided that they would support his winter attack. He was also encouraged by obviously very accurate intelligence, uh, that American forces in the Ardennes were very weak. 
there are only about 75,000 US troops who are going to be facing about 250,000 German ones. So the odds looked good. And those American divisions, again, I'm sure most of you are aware, they were either combat exhausted ones, which had been fighting in the Hurtgen Forest and pulled out the line to recuperate, or they were green divisions, just arrived from the US, who were being acclimatized behind the front before being committed to combat. Crucially, Hitler's intelligence also assessed that the Allies did not have sufficient reinforcements to bolster the Ardennes should he launch an offensive there. As we will see, that transpired to be completely wrong. Now, geography also played a part in encouraging um, Hitler. Monschau, on the German frontier, is about 100 miles from Antwerp, so in military terms, pretty easily achievable. And what happened was, this chap, some of you may know who he is, Colonel Joachim Piper, commander of 1st SS Panzer Regiment, the armoured element of 1st SS Panzer Division. He was summoned by General Kramer, chief of staff of this uh, new 6th Panzer Army. And Kramer said to him, without asking him why he wanted to know this, Kramer said to him, how long would it take you to get a tank to cover 50 miles? Now, Piper, always the good officer and a man to rise to a challenge, he went off that night, got a tank and its crew, and off he trundled. And he came back in the morning and he told Kramer, I covered it overnight on an open road with no resistance. So you can see why getting to the Moose or Antwerp started to seem tantalizingly achievable. Another factor that encouraged Hitler was his meteorologist told him that December, the Ardennes would see heavy snowfalls, and more importantly, as we can see in this photograph, uh, and 101st there on the road to Bastogne with a bazooka. But as this photograph showed, Hitler's weathermen forecasted thick and heavy fog over the Ardennes. And for Hitler, that was crucial because it would ground the Allied air forces and nullify their air superiority. Conversely, of course, it would also ground the Luftwaffe. Um, but Hitler was so pleased with that forecast, he reportedly awarded the head uh, weatherman a gold watch. <laughs> now, bearing in mind what I just said, Hitler had also got it into his head that the Luftwaffe would launch a grand slam air offensive and support the ground operation uh, to deny the Allies use of their forward air bases. That obviously would, as I say, be subject to the weather. And Hitler also had a plan B. As I mentioned, he felt if his troops didn't get to Antwerp, then the V1 and V2s would be used to bombard Antwerp's docks and smash them into ruins. So you can see why Hitler was encouraged to carry out Operation Watch on the Rhine. On paper, it's beginning to look possible. But what other options did the Germans have? Surely an attack towards Antwerp wasn't the only thing that they had on the table. General Heinz Guderian, father of Hitler's panzer forces, uh, founding father really of armor warfare, I guess. But by this stage of the war in 1944, late 1944, he's chief of the general staff of the German army. Uh, because of the peculiarities of the way German high command worked, he pretty much only had responsibility for the Eastern Front. Now, when he heard about those rejuvenated armies, you can guess what he wanted. Logically to him, one army should be positioned on the Oder, ready to fend off the Red Army, which was making enormous gains on the Eastern Front, and the other one should be placed on the Rhine to fend off the Western Allies when they tried to get over the river. It made tactical sense to keep those armoured fists on the far banks or on the home banks of both rivers ready to launch large counterattacks when the Allies tried to cross them. And he wasn't the only one that wasn't happy with the idea of Watch on the Rhine. General Yodel, Chief of Operations at the German High Command, he didn't like it either, thought it overambitious. And what he did was he came up with five smaller options. Now, on the map, as you can see, 
there's the big solution, that great big uh, left hook towards Brussels and Antwerp. Uh, I guess probably brings us to mind people like General Schwarzkopf with Desert Storm in Iraq, um, MacArthur, Inchon with the landings. So it looks quite good on paper. But Yodel said he came up with five alternatives up and down the full length of the Western Front. The most interesting one was at the city of Achin, which, as I said, the Americans had captured in October. And as you can see on the map, front line, look, there's a bulge where the American army had taken the city and cut through the sea creek line defences. And Yodel said, why don't we attack either side of that bulge and trap 15 US divisions? If we do that, it will be a major blow to the Allies' war effort and it will put their offensive operations on hold during the winter. Now, when Field Marshal von Rundstedt, CNC West, uh, and his subordinate, Field Marshal Walter Modell, commander of Army Group B, so in charge of uh, the armies in that part of the world, when they were briefed by their chiefs of staff on watch from the Rhine on the 22nd of October, I think you're probably ahead of me on this, they both favoured that smaller option. It looked achievable. Trying to get to Brussels and Antwerp, they said it was overambitious. It was dangerous. And when they met five days later with uh, General Hasso von Mantufel, commander of 5th Panzer Army, Joseph Sepp Dietrich, commander of 6th Panzer Army, and General Brandenburger, commander of 7th Army, they discussed taking Achin, Liège, and Maastricht and creating this triangular-shaped pocket to trap American forces. To them, it seemed like a good idea. When this was put to Hitler, he wouldn't listen, and he said that three armies were to attack through the Ardennes, and that was the end of it. So what were the drawbacks? Well, I think some of you would be ahead of me again. There's just not enough time to plan a large-scale operation of this nature. It's too rushed. And it's best exemplified by this chap, Otto Skorzeny. Some of you might be familiar with him. SS colonel, in charge of Hitler's special operations. Uh, most notably famous for rescuing Mussolini from house arrest in 1943. He wasn't actually responsible. He just took all the credit, turned up. I mean, he was a real chancer. Turned up, got himself in the glider or the light aircraft with Mussolini. Uh, and flew out of Italy with him uh, and turned up and took all the credit with Hitler. <coughs> so an archetype of spin doctor. But more recently, in October 1944, he pulled off something called Operation Panzerfaust. He and some troops had turned up in Budapest and conducted a coup to stop the Hungarians defecting to the Soviet side. And when he turned up at Hitler's headquarters to brief him on the success of the operation and obviously puffing up his own chest, Hitler said to him, I'm planning this massed operation. It's going to be a major blow against the Western Allies. And I've got a job for you, special operations job. I'm putting you in charge of a special brigade, dubbed 150th Panzer Brigade. And it's going to masquerade as American troops. And it's going to cut a swathe through American lines, reach the River Moose, secure the bridges in advance of the Panzer Assault. Um, you're going to do that for me. And you've got till the beginning of December to get it ready. Skorzeny, understandably, was flabbergasted. Pointed out to Hitler, when Germany captured the Belgian fort of Eben and Mao in 1940, that was a result of six months' meticulous planning. What Hitler wants has got to be done in six weeks. So a rush job. Furthermore, the emphasis was on 6th Panzer Army on the northern shoulder of the attack. And Sepp Dietrich, by his own admission, was not up to the job. In fact, he didn't want the job. Ever since 20th of July 1944 and that famous bomb plot and the attempt to kill Hitler, Hitler didn't trust the army anymore. He was increasingly reliant on the forces of the Waffen-SS, the armed SS. The military arm of um, the SS, which had been created in parallel with the regular army. It quite often came to the rescue of the, Red, uh, the regular army, particularly on the Eastern Front. And increasingly, Hitler was putting his faith in the elite SS divisions. 
But despite temporary commands um, in Normandy, temporary army commands in Normandy, Dietrich was really only a competent corps commander. I have never trained to command an army, he grumbled when he was appointed uh, commander of Sixth Panzer Army. And likewise, Mantufo, until recently, he'd only been a divisional commander, been in charge of something called the Gross Deutschland Division, uh, an elite armoured unit within the German army. And in the summer, he'd been promoted to General Panzer Truppen and now found himself in charge of Fifth Panzer Army. In theory, Dietrich's powerful Sixth Panzer Army was strong enough to turn that northern shoulder uh, in the area of Montchal and make a dash for Antwerp. But the problem the Germans had was General Brandenburger's army on the, at southern flank, on the southern shoulder. Not only was it not strong enough to make an advance, it was clearly not strong enough to fend off any American reinforcements being pushed north to threaten any Amer uh, German breakthrough. And indeed, General Mantufo, he was aware of this and he warned, part of the trouble was due to the way 7th Army had been reduced in strength, for its task was to block the roads running up from the south of Bastogne. Now, of course, if 6th Panzer Army failed to go anywhere, 7th Panzer Army didn't go anywhere, then the emphasis would fall on Mantufel's 5th Panzer Army. And as you can see from the map of what transpired, Mantufel's essentially going in the wrong direction. You've got Liège there in the north, then Antwerp. So he's heading west. He's heading for Dinant on the southern arm of the Moose, going in the completely wrong way. At some point, he'll have to turn north. So an odd and ideal uh, situation. And also, anyone looking at the map with any idea of geography and road layouts in that part of the world is going to go saint Viz or saint Viz in the path of Six Panzer Army, major road junction. The Germans don't capture it in a hurry. Their timetable is going to come off the rails very quickly. Likewise, Bastogne or Bastogne, depending on how you want to pronounce it, sits in the path of Fifth Panzer Army, Major route junction again. The Germans are going to have to get there really quickly or the whole thing is going to come off the rails. And in terms of planning, well, for example, six Panzer Army's core commanders and divisional commanders, they're only notified of their objectives on the 10th of December. So just six days from kickoff. Not enough time to plan anything. And they were told, you've got three days to get to the River Moose and a day to get over it. Now, commanders below divisional level, they didn't receive their orders until the 14th of December, so two days to spare. Colonel Piper, who I mentioned earlier, he was horrified when he was informed that the four battle groups, so the spearheads for 1st Panzer and 12th Panzer, had five routes to use, just five roads. You can see the problem. Any holdups along any of those towns, some famous names there, Malmundi, Stavlot, uh, Eisenborn, any holdups in those towns will cause a delay in the timetable, It'll also force the Germans off the roads. And then they're all going to bunch up, um, and it's going to turn into one giant traffic jam. Now, I won't bore you with a map, but essentially that part of the road, before you reach the River Moose, there are at least eight other rivers to get over. Not ideal for tank commanders. And crucially for the Germans, most of their engineering bridging equipment had been lost on the Eastern Front during the summer of '44, during their withdrawal. So they didn't have much bridging equipment. In fact, they resorted to cutting around trees and doing it old style uh, and prepared to build timber bridges. Another rush job, which I'll only touch on briefly, was uh, Operation Hawk. Hitler got it into his head that he'd have an airborne operation in advance of his panzers to secure a major road junction. The colonel in charge of this, Colonel von der Heide, was given 1,200 men and a week to prepare. There was no time to train or conduct 
um, practice jumps. And some of you may know, by this time in the, in the war, German parachute divisions fought as infantry, so very, very few of them had actually had jump training. So you can appreciate why there was a growing lack of faith amongst the German high command on the feasibility of watch on the Rhine. Field Marshal Walter Modell, he said, this damn thing has got a leg to stand on. And he felt it had less than 10% 10 chance of success. So hardly a ringing endorsement before they've even started. Sepp Dietrich, well, as we know, he didn't want the job. Couldn't turn it down, really. Didn't want the job, didn't feel up to the job. And also, when he looked at it on paper, he said, I'd merely to cross the river, capture Brussels, and then go on and take the port of Antwerp through countryside where snow was waist deep, where there wasn't room to deploy four tanks abreast, let alone six armoured divisions. Now, General Kramer, who I mentioned earlier, who was Dietrich's chief of staff, when he saw Piper, to Colonel Piper, to brief him, he said to him, just make it to the moose, even if you only have got one tank when you, left when you get there. Clearly, the indication was that Dietrich and Kramer hoped to save face by at least telling Hitler they had reached the river. Now, Walter Modell, commander of Army Group B, whose job it really was to try and shape German strategy along with von Rundstedt, he stood up to Hitler on the 2nd of December and told him what he thought of the plan. Did no good. And not surprisingly, the Luftwaffe didn't want anything to do with the operation either. Adolf Garland, pretty famous name. Some of you will know him. Famous fighter ace uh, during the Battle of Britain. By this stage, he was commander of the Luftwaffe's fighter forces defending the airspace over Nazi Germany. Uh, desperately trying to fend off the Allied strategic bomber campaign. Garland had come up with this plan that he called a big blow. What he wanted to do was put up as many fighter aircraft in a single sortie against a massed American daylight air raid and shoot down, if he could manage it, several hundred bombers in one go. Pretty sobering. Because he felt if he did that, the Allies would have to pause their strategic bomber campaign, rethink their tactics, and that would give Germany's cities, and more importantly, Germany's armament factories, respite over the winter. Unfortunately for Garland, he was about to conduct a training exercise to see whether this would work in terms of coordinating all the fighter stations or the fighter groups when it turned into the real thing. And he had to put up as many fighters as he could to fend off a real attack. Upshot was they didn't shoot down many bombers. And when Hitler saw the figures, he said, no, big blow, waste of time. It's not going to achieve anything. I want around 600 fighter aircraft available to support. You've guessed it. Watch on the Rhine. And Hitler's faith on quali qu quality over quantity was misplaced. Again, mentioned earlier, an iconic photograph here. Um, Tiger II with German Fallschirmjäger or paratroops on it. Very, very powerful tank. Incredibly well-armoured, long-range gun. As I mentioned earlier, it was designed as a breakthrough tank. But it was designed for the Eastern Front, for the Russian steppe, where the open landscape will play to its strengths. Its long-range guns can kill Soviet tanks at its leisure. Its thick army will then let it roll through Soviet defences. Good bit of kit. But you're all ahead of me because you can see from the photo the drawback. In the wooded Ardennes, that gun's no good because the gunner can't see any distance. The thing's going to be vulnerable to light anti-tank guns and as it transpired, very, very brave bazooka teams creeping up on the things and shooting them close range. Furthermore, Germans always over-engineered things um, but there was always a basic flaw in them. General Gadurin, when he was in charge of development of Hitler's panzer forces, he said the engine of the tank is no less a weapon than the gun. Tiger II was 10 tons heavier, so 68 tons, 10 tons heavier than the Tiger I, and it had the same engine, so underpowered. And at 68 tons in the Ardennes, 
the roads aren't going to take it. And more importantly, beautiful part of the world, covered in lots of medieval bridges, really old stone bridges, and they're not going to take the weight of those tanks. So immediately, Tiger II becomes a liability. Furthermore, there weren't enough of them. Uh, Colonel Piper's battle group would end up about 20 or so. Um, and all, they reckon there were about 150 gathered. But once they were parceled out amongst the units, they were in penny packets. So there weren't enough Tigers. There weren't enough Panzer Fives, the Panther. Again, good piece of kit, but there just weren't enough of them. And likewise, Hitler's jet fighters and his jet bombers, they weren't available in any great numbers either due to infighting amongst the uh, development programs. And his flying bombs, woefully inaccurate, as I mentioned earlier. They're terror weapons. They're not designed for pinpoint accuracy. They're designed to kill civilians and terrorise populations. So hopefully I've set the scene a bit, explained partly why Hitler got it into his head, why it was a good idea, why his generals didn't think it was a good idea, what the options were. Let me say a bit about the battle. Um, I'm sure you all know the main beats. Uh, commenced on 6th of December, 1944. And in very short order, caught the American army by surprise, surprise and very rapidly broke through. But tactically and strategically, the thing that stands out to me is that within 24 hours, General Eisenhower had four divisions of reinforcements on the way, including, of course, the famous 82nd and 101st Airborne. So Hitler got it wrong when it came to reinforcements. And of course, that's not mentioning, or not including, the two corps of Patton's 3rd US Army to the south of the German breakthrough. And Patton loved this sort of scrap, as we all know. He liked a good fist fight, and he was a man that, you know, for all his faults, he thought on his feet. And when he heard what had happened, even before he got orders from Ike, he was already telling the US Third Army to turn around and drive like hell north. What happened to the Germans? Well, the SS battle groups initially successfully broke through, and then they struggled to make headway. Um, Hold-ups and snarl-ups caused terrible traffic jams on the, on the roads. Units became mixed up. Scorseni Special Operations Brigade couldn't even get forward, so ended up having to fight his regular troops. Only his commando teams uh, had any measure of success. Uh, some of them actually reached the moose and observed the bridges, but they were simply too weak to secure the bridges themselves. So after doing uh, you know, some reconnaissance work and reporting about their findings, they had to make their way back east. That parachute drop I mentioned, conducted at night, complete disaster. Paratroops were dropped everywhere, including... Germany, behind their own lines. <laughs> those, that <laughs> those that did end up in the Ardennes, too few of them managed to regroup, and they ended up having to hide out in the forests until they were overrun. What happened on the ground? Well, what Hitler's generals predicted came to pass. German 66th Corps in the north very quickly became snarled up at this place, St. Viv, while 47th Panzer Corps in the south, likewise, you've got it, became snarled up at Bastogne. It took the Germans a week to capture St. Viv. <coughs> and although the, the defenders suffered about 5,000 casualties, 15,000 American troops escaped to fight another day. And as I'm sure uh, those of you familiar with the battle, American army fought an exemplary defensive action here. Initially, they conducted what was called the horseshoe defense to the east of the town. When that came under pressure and couldn't hold, they then withdrew to the west of the town, created what was called the goose egg defense. And then when that came under pressure, it withdrew over the nearest local river to await reinforcements. That delay, understandably, proved fatal. A week's gone, and yet Hitler wanted them to reach the river within three days. Mm. 
Within that week, battle group Piper ran out of food and ammunition. They suffered a miserable fate. They ended up trapped at Leglise, ended up having to abandon all their equipment eventually and working their way in very small groups back east towards German lines. Mantoufel's tanks tantalisingly got to within four miles of Dinant on that southern arm of the Moose. Again, too far south, really. Um, but suffered the same fate. In particular, his second panzer division got to cells where it ran out of fuel and ammo. And, of course, it's that point, <clears throat> as we all famously know, the weather played a hand in things, and the skies cleared. And that let loose Allied fighter bombers to hound and harry all the Germans' exposed columns, which, of course, on a winter landscape in the snow, stuck out like sore thumbs. But the other thing, of course, that Hitler had underestimated was Allied airlift capacity. And within very short order, they managed to drop 1,000 tonnes of supplies into Bastogne, and the battered bastards, 101st, leading the defence, just in the nick of time. Because their artillery, reportedly, was down to the last 10 rounds per gun. So they were only firing when they had to. Germans, obviously, didn't realise how very close they'd come to taking the place. But, of course, that airlift turned things around uh, and saved the garrison. Which, I should point out, had tied up elements of four German divisions which were supposed to be heading west, but obviously we're not going anywhere. And also, of course, by that stage, Patton was on the way, and as we say, the rest is history. But what about Operation Bodenplatt, or base plate I mentioned earlier, that grand slam Luftwaffe air attack on the Allies' forward air, air bases? Well, that took place in the new year, so two weeks after the ground offensive started. No use whatsoever and taking the pressure off those German troops fighting in the bulge. Now, Luftwaffe did a pretty good job, actually, under the circumstances, destroyed several hundred aircraft, but in the process lost several hundred of theirs. Uh, obviously, this will be discussed later during the air war sex of it. But for the Germans, they lost lots and lots of pilots. And what their young and largely inexperienced pilots did was they spent far too, time, too long over the target area shooting up aircraft on runways, when they should have been shooting up barrack block buildings and accommodation in an effort to kill pilots. And also, they lingered around in the air too long to take part in dogfights, and as a consequence, suffered the, um, being shot down quite often as they limped home. Now, for the Allies, the loss of 200 aircraft or so, a bit of a nuisance, but Allied industrial muscle was such that it could replace those aircraft very, very quickly. Hitler couldn't. And crucial, as I say, most of the pilots survived to fight another day, whereas the Germans didn't. What about the V1 and V2 offensive against Antwerp that I mentioned earlier? Pretty horrific photograph, I'm afraid, but it does bring home the horrors of war, and in fact, it's included in my, my book. Trouble with the V1 and V2? Completely inaccurate. Killed hundreds of civilians and servicemen failed to make any impact on the docks whatsoever. And likewise, what about the Alsace? That offensive to recapture the French city of Strasbourg, drive a wedge between the French and American armies, uh, and hopefully throw back the Allies. Again, launched in the new year. Way too late to have any impact on the fighting in the Ardennes. And the French, understandably, said they were not going to conduct a tactical withdrawal from Strasbourg. It's a matter of national honour, which forced both the French and armies to fight where they stood, which they did. Germans didn't really have sufficient strength to make much headway, and the whole thing ran out of steam very quickly. So what should they have done in the Ardennes? Well... If they were going to do it, they should have put the emphasis, I think, on that central portion, so 5th Panzer Army, because the roads are better there. If they'd made their, a tactical decision to grab Bastogne from the start, made that their goal, battle might have gone a little differently. Instead, all hopes were pinned on Sepp Dietrich and his SS Panzer Divisions, to the extent that when he got snarled up on the northern shoulder and held up, he was reinforced, whereas when 
Mantufo made that breakthrough in the centre. He didn't get any reinforcements. So too much reliance was placed on the SS. And indeed, Field Marshal von Ronsted, he later admitted the decision was a fundamental mistake that unbalanced the whole offensive. So he watched on the Rhine was flawed from the start. Planning was simply inadequate. It's too reliant on US forces in the Ardennes being a pushover. And it's American resistance in the Ardennes that gives, gives me pause to smile because the American army gave the Germans a taste of their own medicine. Again, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, US troops put together all these task, force, task forces, ad hoc units, cooks, mechanics, clerks, signalers, anything they could lay their hands on to create combat groups to slow down the German advance while reinforcements are summoned. Germans better know those types of units as Kampfgruppen or battle groups, which they were a dab hand at doing, which they'd done in Normandy, they'd done in North Africa, they did on the Eastern Front. And the Americans turned the tables on them and did exactly the same thing to the Germans. And I agree with Guderian. Hitler would have been better off preserving his strength to hold the Rhine and the Oder. Which very conveniently... <laughs> <laughs> brings me to my next book, which is a follow-up to, uh, to Hitler's Winter. And that looks at the German defence, from a German point of view, of the Rhineland, uh, both before and after the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, it's not due out till next October, so don't get too excited. Um, well, that's a good place to wrap up, I think. Uh, hopefully that's given you some food for thought this morning. Thank you very much for your kind time and attention. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we know the drill. Raise your hand and Connie <laughs> Gentry and myself will bring the microphone to you. We'll ask that you stand up so that uh, the speaker and the cameras can see you with your question. Anthony, the first question is going to be towards the back in the center aisle. Uh, in the Pacific Theater, uh, the United States made a decision in their island hopping campaign to bypass islands, and I think in MacArthur's words, just to leave the unattacked islands to wither on the vine. Why couldn't we use the same strategy at Bastogne? Just, or excuse me, the Germans use the same strategy, just bypass it completely and leave it to wither on the vine in the rear. Uh, good question, very good question. Um, they sort of tried that, they did half and half. So what they tended to do, as I said, it tied down four German divisions, but only elements. So some of those are also still pulling, pushing to the west. But the problem that the Germans had was if they left the garrison at Bastogne, obviously once the weather cleared, it would be resupplied and it would be sitting there right in the middle of German supply lines. Um, so the Germans would have had to commit large amounts of troops to pin down the garrison, even if they were still pulling westwards, because there'd be nothing to stop the garrison you know, issuing forth to attack uh, German supply convoys. So they... They didn't really have much choice, but they didn't have the strength to take it either. That's, that's, that's the problem. Um, ultimately, they, as I said at the end of my talk, they really should have made a decision to dash there as quickly as possible. Um, you know, as we know, 101st Airborne beat them to it. Uh, so if they'd just been a bit quicker off the mark, they might have taken it. But I think they just knew that they couldn't, they couldn't leave the garrison in place and continue pressing west. Next question is going to be towards the front in the center aisle. <clears throat> what was Hitler's reaction to the lost battle of the bulge? And um, did he finally realize, along with Speer, that maybe the war, this battle would have, the, maybe the war was over for Germany? Um, he understandably wasn't pleased. I mean, in the name of brevity, I didn't mention the fact that the idea was the two panzer armies conduct watch on the Rhine, and then one of them will be pulled out of the line, assuming that it was successful, will be pulled out of the line to do a similar job on the Eastern Front and launch a counterattack against them. Um, the Germans had predicted that the Soviet Oda Vistia offensive would take place, I think, on, I'm going from memory, but from 12th of January, I think it was. 
So it was a race against time for the Germans because they had to divert some of those forces massed from what's on the Rhine at some point to help shore up the Eastern Front. Um, initially, Hitler's response, as always, was to stick his head in the sand. He didn't want to admit that it hadn't worked. So when logic dictated that they were not going to go west any further, they should have withdrawn their forces from the bulge, but Hitler insisted they stayed there, uh, with the bulge slowly contracting under pressure. They stayed there until the end of January. So he, he didn't do himself any favours. And then, of course, when the troops of 5th Panzer Army and 7th Army heard that 6th Panzer Army, which once it was on the Eastern Front became known as an SS Army, when they heard it was being pulled out of the line, they were not pleased because they went, well, that's typical. They're being given favourable treatment. Your offence is not working, and Hitler's now saving them for a rainy day. What they didn't know, of course, was they were being plonked on trains and sent to Hungary. Next question is to the very back, to your right, Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Um, the uh, question I have is um, quality versus quantity. Um, you, know, the, it, you know, I think in, in some ways, uh, NATO's also gotten that bug a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about why, that, why doubling down on that? And then the other thing brings to mind is like, certainly the, um, the Tiger IIs are needed on the Vistula, you know, rather than the forest. Yeah. Um. Um, yeah, I mean, the, his, his reliance on technology was, all, well, I think, all part of this desperate scrabble to find a solution. I think he just felt if he could find the right combination of high-tech weapons, that would somehow turn the tide in his favour. Um, but the problem is, as I said earlier, most of it was, you know, German engineering par excellence over-engineered, so they couldn't build it quick enough. So, um, and also what they tended to do was design equipment rather than being good all-rounders. They would design it to do a specific thing. So in the instance of the V weapons, well, they were, they were basically going to replace the Luftwaffe and be used as terror weapons to bomb cities. So they weren't tactical weapons because they weren't accurate enough. Um, and again, it was part of this sort of confusion that the Germans had on their manufacturing priorities. So Gudurin had always resisted um, building assault guns, you know, which are turretless tanks, which are really defensive weapons because you can't traverse the gun much. Um, so Gudurin was opposed to that, but the army needed as many armoured vehicles as quickly as possible. So Panzer III production switched to that instead. Likewise, the idea was that Panzer IV production will be switched to the Panther V, but retooling takes time, so you can't do that. So they had to keep the Panzer IV in production, which slowed down production of the Panther. You know, so they got themselves in this horrible knot, if you like, over what their priorities were. We've got a couple up in the front. Yep. We'll start to your right, Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, my question is, you've already referred to von Manteuffel and people like that have, taking a very dim view of this effort entirely. And I'm wondering about uh, the psychological effect, whether that would have filtered down into uh, the rank and file, where the enthusiasm, other than, than Piper uh, and people like that, yeah. uh, maybe, uh, you know, the, the uh, enlisted might have felt yeah, this ain't such a great idea. I'm not sure I'm going to be uh, a whole hog into this thing. Did your research indicate any of that? Yes, um, that's a very good point. Again, brevity, I didn't really dwell on it, but before the offensive started, morale amongst the rank and file was really high. Because you can, as you can imagine, while they were massing all those forces in secret under the cover of the Ardennes forest, for the average German soldier, they're looking around going, this is like 1940. You know, there are all these divisions, all these troops, all these regenerated divisions, all this new armour. So initially, um, morale amongst the rank and file was really, really good. It was only the upper echelons that are kind of appreciated, you know, that, to use an expression, they were biting off more than they can chew. So morale was really good at grassroots level. I think by the end of January, that had changed because they, 
they knew for all that blood, sweat and toil that actually they'd not achieved anything and they were back where they started. And not only had they done that, of course, they'd expended a lot of manpower and a lot of that, that, that new equipment. Um, I mean, the rejuvenation of the, those armies in the West, it's called the miracle of the West. You know, when you consider what a condition they were in after, you know, Normandy and the, and the collapse, to have withdrawn enough troops to then re regenerate new armies was a ma an amazing um, achievement. But to then squander them could not have been good for German morale. And the German, you know, the German generals knew that. Um, you, they kind of, by the end of 44, they knew they were going to lose the war. It was just a question of how. And also it's that sort of desperate clinging all the time to maybe some sort of negotiated peace could take place. But as we know, the hurdle to that was Hitler. You know, the Allies wanted an unconditional surrender, uh, which put the German armed forces in that position on a bound that they were. Their loyalty was to the Fuhrer. So there was, no, there was no wriggle room for them, if you like, to get out of the war. So they had to keep on fighting. So the real question at the end of the war is, you know, as I discussed with the options, is how could they put off the inevitable? And of course, what they did was, with Watch on the Rhine, they actually speeded up the inevitable by wasting so much of all that stuff that they'd rebuilt. I'm going to go over here. Steve, I'll get you later, bud. <coughs> Last question is in the front to your left. Hi. Um, I've always wondered, like, by now it's 1944, where is Germany getting all the material to make the tanks? Like, where is this coming from? Fabulous question, really is. Um, I mean, I don't know what everyone's view is on the strategic bomber campaign, but clearly it wasn't working if Hitler could regenerate his armies at the end of 1944. What Nazi Germany had done is it stockpiled a huge amount of resources. Its ability to replenish them was contracting because, of course, a lot of the t occupied territories where they got it from, you know, such as oil from Hungary, they were losing. So actually what Germany was doing was its future, its fate it was facing, was running out of those raw materials. So by 1944, early 45, Albert Speer, the Nazi armaments minister, he pretty, knew, he pretty well knew that within months they would, the factories would grind to a halt, not because they'd been bombed into oblivion, but because they simply did not have the raw materials to carry on manufacturing. So in a way, I say, I don't know what people's views are, Albert Speer, but he was quite a remarkable man in, in what he achieved with those, with those factories because Hitler, almost right until the end, bizarrely insisted on not putting Germany on a total war footing, you know, although the entire nation has harnessed war effort. He refused to sort of declare a national war effort. So what um, Speer did was quite remarkable, particularly as apart from the slave labor that, of course, Germany had imported into those factories. Speer was constantly fighting a rearguard battle to stop his German workers being conscripted into units such as the Volksgrenadier divisions. But, sorry, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but essentially Nazi Germany had, a, had up to that point a pretty good initially access, as the occupied territories were overrun, a good stockpile. But that, but that was coming to an end. They'd nearly used it, most of it up. Uh, and likewise with fuel. They were desperately short of fuel. One of the good things that the Allied Strategic Bomber Campaign did was it kept on pounding Germany's synthetic oil factories, you know, where they turned coal into oil. They kept bombing those, and that was having a detrimental effect. So it got to the point where, you know, uh, the Luftwaffe was running out of fuel. Um, it got to the bizarre point where it was moving aircraft using horses on the runways because they didn't have the, didn't have the petrol for the towing tractors. Um, so in that respect, so again, raw materials and oil they were running out of. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for Anthony Tucker Jones. <coughs> Anthony, thank you for the wonderful overview. Uh, it set us up, I think, pretty, pretty well for the following sessions. Uh, Anthony will be outside at the book signing station. Please go out and buy all the books, and you know the deal on that. We <laughs> ship them for free after a certain number of purchases. But we will uh, recommence at 9.30 sharp for our next session on intelligence in the Ardennes. Thank you. <laughs>